Greetings, this is the High Priest of Kick, and today's broadcast, we're going to read aloud from George Fitzhugh. I'm going to talk a little bit about George Fitzhugh before I read aloud from his work, and the work I'll be reading aloud from <clears throat> is uh, The Conservative Principle, or Social Evils and Their Remedies. And uh, this is just one of Fitzhugh's works. Of course, he's more fa he's most famous for Cannibals All. And uh, he wrote another book as well. Fitzhugh was very influenced by Thomas Carlyle and also by Pruden and a lot of other thinkers of that sort. And I think it's very interesting to bring him up at this period of time because Fitzhugh was rather unique in his time period because he advocated slavery, not only for the African race, but also for the European race. And, or for elements of the European race. And what's interesting about that, especially now as James LaFon is documenting or working on this whole thesis of his, that <clears throat> slavery has always been the de facto or a de facto element of civilization. It's always been a very important and integral uh, played an integral role in civilization, and it is necessary uh, to maintain a civilization at any level. And moreover, we have a very precarious position awaiting us in the near future because you have thousands of people that have been basically set free from the bounds of authority and the bounds of any discipline to be used as a buffer and a weapon or a shield and a buckler, as they, the Bible would say, against the classes of individuals that the powers that be seek to eliminate. So these classes that, you know, the, the, it's been the revolt of the servile race, you know, uh, who was it that wrote, uh, well, I think Lothrop started wrote the rising tide of color, but it's more than that because you can see most ethnic whites of inferior background who continue to reproduce. And then you have the whole background of idiocracy, the movie and so forth and so on. But the bat, the, at the end of the day, the basic point is that slavery is the natural status of most human beings. And without understanding that you have a problem. So I'm going to read aloud from, Pruden, uh, from George Fitzhugh. He was a very interesting guy. Mencius Moldbug wrote something about him, but Moldbug re uh, basically rejects Fitzhugh out of hand, unfortunately, even though, you know, he goes back to, uh, he wants to go to, uh, who was it, uh, Filmer, because Hobbes wasn't radical enough. And in many ways, uh, Hobbes was a disgruntled liberal, it's true, or what have you. And Filmer was, in many ways, uh, the, I guess, the Jewish uh, preference as opposed to de Maester for some reason, because Filmer throws his all behind the authority of the monarch, whereas de Maester realizes he goes more into the Christianity or the Christian the theological aspect of the matter, and that is the uh, supreme being is not the king, but God, and the king is but a representative of God on earth. And this is the background for authority, because this is what we really lack in our society today, is authority to a degree. And what I mean by that, and we're going to read <clears throat> more of this from Fitzhugh, is a, is a simple lack of of any kind of centralized authority. Everyone is against the idea of a centralized authority. Now, in the old days, for example, people would say he is an authority on that subject, and you don't hear that anymore because an authority on that subject might have the last word on that subject on the basis of his education and ability to understand that subject comprehensively and having studied it for years. So, you had a pretty good idea of these individuals. Nowadays, you don't have anybody who is deemed an authority on any subject because they don't want anybody to have any authority at all. 
And what's very interesting, I thought I would talk about a little bit in the course of this broadcast uh, was the idea of the Twitter recent Twitter purges. And it's very interesting because there's no centralized individual that one can fundamentally hold to blame. And this is why when the rubber meets the road, it's a very good position for those individuals who are profiting from these bans uh, to be in because unconsciously the unconscious mind of those individuals who are banned and disgruntled about it realizes that there is no person that they can hold to account for the situation because nobody is fundamentally responsible for the situation so in many ways we've created a world without a centralized authority that one can challenge and there is and you know consequently you see a situation where everyone can be the other and everybody can think both sides of the rebels in their in the uh, Star Wars movie in their brains, you know. So nobody is Darth Vader anymore, and you don't have any centralized authority. So both sides are fighting, or view themselves. I was going to say envision themselves, but I, I was kind of stuck in limbo there. You saw a real time conundrum as I struggled for the preferred verbiage, I guess, uh, whether I should say uh, view themselves or what was the other word I used? Visualized, whatever. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Envisioned. Envisioned is a fine word. It's not used enough anymore because nobody envisions anything anymore. The, the act of envisioning something, of dreaming it into being is almost unheard of in our society today. And uh, so <clears throat> I was going to say all that being understood, but I think I'll skip that, skip that one. So <clears throat> in this situation, we see that those individuals on both sides view themselves as the underdogs. So we have two sets of underdogs and nobody in charge. And so Jack Dorsey looks like a homeless guy. Are you going to blame Jack Dorsey? Are you going to stand Jack Dorsey up, the, up against the wall? Jack Dorsey is going to explain to you that he is not in charge. Who is really in charge? Who makes the decisions? And that's the interesting thing about when the devil runs the world, which he always has and always will, um, you know, barring the intervention of God Almighty, you have a situation in which this the uh, natural challenge to authority, especially the authority of God Almighty, is constant is the constant form as a constant idol that is being worshipped. In other words, authority is fundamentally to be something that is entirely eschewed by society, and this is why you see all forms of authority breaking down, even though you have a system of totalitarianism. Uh, anarcho tyranny, tyranny, if you will, according to the late Sam Francis. But nonetheless, in these circumstances, you still have a overall situation. Shut up, Chloe. Wherein <clears throat> these individuals are running everything, and yet there is no person to whom whom you can finger and say that person is responsible for this situation. That person is fundamentally the problem or that group, or that corporation. You can to a degree, but if you climb up the food chain, and even if you had a were in a position to judge them, they would plead that they were fundamentally powerless, that they lacked the desire to rule or be held responsible for anything. And so nobody wants to claim responsibility for anything. And this being understood, we're going to... This is the uh, prerogative of the slave to be utterly irresponsible, to have no, to exercise no responsibility, and to be responsible only to their master. Now, in the case of the powers that be, their master is Satan. So you have a whole situation going on there, and a lot of people say, "Oh, I don't believe in God. It's atheism, this and that." It, it's kind of irrelevant at this point because, as I said, the awesome thing about the world today is that argumentation is no longer in any way relevant. Are you going to argue 
as the world burns, you know, are you going to have that conversation as the rafters of your house are in flames? You know, there's, there's a, there's a point in time when people are not going to be interested in that kind of argumentation or being or interested in the fallacies that people want to rehash for the millionth time. So <clears throat> I'm going to read from George Fitzhugh's uh, article. It's uh, quite an interesting article and I, read it this morning and I thought uh, very interesting. Uh, he had written this book, uh, Cannibals All or Slaves Without Mat Masters, which have the, in their aim a defense of slavery from a higher standpoint and a refutation of those who claim to be part of what is called a free society that is a panacea for every evil. Without assenting or dissenting, we shall give with pleasure his views on this and the next number of the review. Now, this is where we begin the article. <clears throat> that was a foreword. The Republican majority in the House of Representatives and the large sectional vote obtained by Fremont are facts which, taken alone, suffice to show our union is imperiled. As the danger becomes more imminent, the thoughtful, the prudent, and the patriotic should combine more closely and redouble their, their efforts to avert it. For none but the rash, the thoughtless, and the wicked can look with indifference to an event so pregnant with consequences. For weal or woe, not only to Americans, but to all civilized mankind. Our union is the great asylum for the starving millions of Europe who have got the means to immigrate and largely helps to feed and clothe those who are too poor to remove. The civilized world is now and has been for years suffering from the insufficient production of food and clothing, the essential necessities of life. Get up civil war and disunion in America and subtract, therefore, the present American surplus from this already insufficient supply, and hunger and nakedness would afflict and decimate a large portion of mankind, at least until new agricultural regions were developed and large accessions to agricultural labor obtained from some quarter. Much time would be required to effect such sanitary results, and in the interim, the amount of human suffering would likely to ensue appalls the imagination. A, a famine in Ireland carries off in a single season 300,000 souls and it and expels three millions from their homes. A civil war in America would be a potato rot for Christendom. Her surplus of meat and grains and cotton would be for a time at least vanish and human souls might by the million vanish with it. We have said that they who could look with indifference to disunion would be wicked, must be wicked, yet we do say that the thousands of good men who des desire it in order to avert greater evils which they apprehend from a continuance of the union. We, too, see these latter evils. We have probed them to the bottom. They are startling in number, in magnitude and enormity, but we cannot escape them by flight. We must meet them face to face and conquer them. Disunion would precipitate their advent and increase their strength. The South, separated from the rest of Christendom, might produce vastly more of the necessaries and comforts of life than she could consume. But a world at war with her institutions and starving for the want of her, pro her products might not respect her rights. The hungry millions of Christendom would easily find a Peter the Hermit or an Alaric to head and lead an invasion of her soil. If none others flock to such a standard, our neighbors of the free states, with a yearly ascension of 300,000 immigrants from Europe, would not be despicable either in strength, courage, or numbers. Bigotry and fanaticism, nakedness and hunger, impelling them 
and the fair fields and luscious and abundant fruits of the south inviting them. They would at, le would at least give us occupation enough to leave us neither time or labor for the production of an agricultural surplus. Yet such an invasion, even if successful, would be ten times more disastrous to the rest of Christendom than to the south. It would not only arrest the production of our agricultural surplus, but might, by abolishing slaver, slavery, cut off that surplus forever. Like Mexico and the West Indies and South America, the South would become useless to the world at large. Still, if the present white population of the South continued to build the lands, hunger and nakedness could never affect us, afflict us. However, our civ civilization might decline. Now let us calmly and rigidly inquire for what peculiar offense the South is arraigned. The Union endangered, and all Christendom threatened with war, nakedness, and famine. The institution of domestic slavery as it exists at the South, as it has existed until recently throughout the world, and as it now exists in nine-tenths of the world, is the commonly assigned cause for these impending disasters. But the true cause of the quarrel lies deeper. It is not merely Negro slavery, but the slavery principle, slavery in every form, that of the great moral and intellectual movement of the day, that, that the great moral and intellectual movement of the day proposes to remedy and remove. Those who feel so much for the Negroes of the West Indian, Indies and of America begin to feel quite as much for wives, children, apprentices, wards, sailors, soldiers, and hirelings, nay, for the weak and poor, for they begin to discover that the principle and the practice of slavery is found interwoven with all human relations and human institutions as now existing, and with the unflinching philanthropy they have resolved to cut a sheer asunder all those relations. They most consistently and courageously wage war against slavery in every form. The principle and practice wherever found must be eradicated and a transition infected from the current state of society to a millennial, an agrarian or communistic sta status. Government, they agree, is but slavery, variously modified from slavery to law down to jails, penitentiaries, stocks, manacles, and the gallows. All human government must therefore be abolished, and the sovereignty of the individual, free love, attractive labor, and passionate attraction supply its place. It is, now, it is time now, high time, that conservatism should take its stand and begin its defense. Yet what do we see? The whole active intellect of Christendom headed by such men as Pruden and Andrews, busy in writing novels and poems and philosophical books and essays and lectures and sermons, directly assailing every existing governmental arrangement. We see their whole literary literature tinctured and tainted with every shade of revolutionary radicalism. And yet conservatism folds its arms with supine indifference and makes not an effort at defense. There is not, we believe, one single avowedly conservative anti-socialistic press in the world. Whilst we have no doubt that there are a hundred organs of the isms, even in our north, many hundreds more in Europe, the numbers of the zeal, the numbers, the zeal, the audacity, and the ability of our enemies render them formidable now, and if not soon opposed, will render them irresistible. Conservatives, North and South, in Europe and America, have everything sacred, dear, and precious in this world. And the next at stake, sh and should, I'll start that again. Conservatives, North and South, in Europe and America, have everything sacred, dear, and precious in this world, and the next at stake and should combine on some common ground in active and efficient defense. 
Our adversaries have marked out that ground for us so distinctly that we cannot mistake it. They make war, they say, on the principle and practice of slavery in every form, and further say that all human government and all human institutions involve slavery, and therefore they would destroy all. Andrews, the Prudhan of America, declares in his lectures that New York would govern itself much better without a police. The better classes in New York, or some of them, applaud the suggestion. Andrews gets up a saloon of free love to try the inter interesting experiment, but cruel Mayor Wood nips it in the bud. This was the, this was the first collision of the opposite principles and the practices of government and no government, of the sovereignty of society and the sovereignty of the individual. Or rather, of slavery and of anti-slavery. The free lovers have came off worsted, but they gather courage and numbers too, from defeat and displayed in the great battle of the presidential election, a strength, a courage, and a zeal greater than ever exhibited before. We do not pretend to say that every black Republican in America understands the principles, the theories, and the aims of his party, as well as Andrews' in America. Nor do the Red Republicans, the same party in Europe, stand alongside of Pruden. The mass but follow, while Pruden and Louis Blanc and Andrews and Garrison and such like philosophers lead and direct the movement. A social revolution certainly impends throughout free society, and that revolution directed at first against Negro slavery now proposes to destroy all religion, all governments, and all private property because of the principle and practice of slavery are found to exist in them. And all the other existing human institutions. The defense of the Southern slavery involves necessarily the defense of every existing human institution because they are all alike assailed by abolition as modifications of slavery itself. You of the North cannot conquer them without taking issue with them. You cannot admit their premises and deny their conclusions. If slavery be wrong in principle, wrong in the abstract, and all the government inst governmental institutions are wrong and should be abolished. If Negro slavery be wrong because it is slavery, then our marriage and church government and separate ownership of lands and parental authority equally wrong, unless it is be proven proved that white slavery, which these institutions occasion, is free from the objections which apply to all other kinds of slavery. Conservatives, North and South, have not an inch of ground to stand upon unless they at once boldly and distinctly take the position that slavery in the abstract, slavery in the general, slavery in principle, is right, natural, and necessary. Right, natural, and necessary because it has been universal. Because, for there is no so-called free society in the world in which four-fifths of the people are not slaves, governed and controlled, not by mere law, but by the will and ipsa-dixit of, ipsa of superiors, right also because it is sanctioned alike by human and divine law. The slavery principle is common ground on which conservatives North and South may combine, and from which they may assail abolition and socialism, defend and preserve the Union, protect the sanctity of marriage, secure private property, maintain parental authority, and conserve all other institutions. We defy human ingenuity to meet and make headway against the movement that threatens the subversion of a society on any other terms but these. I say some northern or southern man, we agree that slavery is wrong in principle, wrong in the general, wrong in the abstract, but Negroes are sort of monkeys and form an exception 
they ought to have they ought to be slaves at least until we can improve and educate them and send them back to Africa. Agreed, says the strong-minded bloomer. You yield the principle, says the, uh, and as the white women are not monkeys, you have given up the marriage relation, which subjects them to slavery. We'll compromise, set the women free, and hold the Negroes in slavery. Agreed, says the infidel. You admit white slavery to be wrong, and therefore admit the Bible, which establishes and justifies it, to be false. Help me to oust the parsons and burn the churches and the Bible, that you may keep your interesting Negroes. Agreed, says the agrarian. You will go in with me for a general division of the lands, because land monopoly begets white slavery, and you defend only Negro slavery. Agreed, says Pruden, Andrews, and all the other socialists. Tis true we are opposed to all government, but since you have yielded the slavery principle and given up all the other institutions of society, we defy you to hold your Negroes. You are practically socialists. Yes, mere Negro slavery is socialism minus the darkies. And they too, and they would soon be forced into the common mass of free love, free lands, free Negroes, and free women. The defense of Negro slavery as an exceptional institution is the most absurdly untenable prep proposition that was ever maintained by man. Yet we are glad to hear men propound it because they are sure not to stop there. The arguments and facts that convince them of the propriety of Negro slavery will soon carry them farther, and they will find that slavery in every form is right and necessary, as times, place, and circumstances vary. Just as abolitionists, beginning with the assertion that Negro slavery is immoral and iniquitous, find themselves gradually driven to the conclusion that all government is but slavery in different forms. So Negro slavery defenders will find that the only arguments by which they can defend that, that institution apply to all forms of slavery and all subordinations of rank or office. The great objection to confining the defense of slavery to the Negro and giving up the general principle is that it cuts off conservatives of the, nor of the South from alliance with conservatives of the North. There it, is a very, there, it is various modifications of white slavery or quasi-slavery that abolition and socialism assail, and that by all the destructive plans and purposes of ab abolition, <clears throat> and socialism at home are right. We cannot consistently help northern conservatives to defend their hearths and homes against the free lover, the infidel, and the agrarian, because we have in effect admitted that these worse than Gothic invaders are right. Other institutions of society than domestic slavery are not yet assailed at the South, but if socialism demoralizes, disintegrates, and subverts society in Western Europe and our North, it will be too late to oppose it when it invades the South. We employ this term slavery in this essay in a broader sense than it is usually given to it, than is usually given to it. Yet we employ it with precision and accuracy, as well as comprehensiveness. First, <clears throat> because it is thus broadly used and applied by our opponents, the isms of the day. And to meet their issues fully, we must accept the term as intended and defined by them. And secondly, and chiefly because of their use and definition of the word slavery is correct. The best criteria of slavery are, the two best criteria of slavery are, a social status in which the will and superior controls the will of the superior controls and directs the will and action of the inferior. Or a social condition in which man becomes the property of his fellow man. Man. Take either criterion, and all human government is manifestly slavery. In despotic governments, the will and conduct of all subjects may be controlled by an autocrat. In democracies, by a majority. 
in armies, navies, and merchant service by superior officers, in families by the parent or master, on farms, in stores, in every business operation of life by the employer. The Negro slave is not controlled and directed in all his actions by his master. The freest white city citizen is controlled and directed in much of his conduct by, the gov by his government. We are by birth and nature the creatures of, and slaves of society, and therefore none altogether free. <clears throat> but we have individual rights and responsibilities of which no form of slavery can or intends to intends to entirely divest us. Society is of itself the practical assertion that man has property in man. He cannot live alone. By mere force of nature, by intu intuitive, intuitive necessity, the strong protect and control the weak, and the weak serve and obey the strong. But the property in each case is mutual. The husband is by nature, as well as law, master of wife and children, and bound to provide for, protect and govern them, for they are his property, but he is equally theirs. This is the German nucleus of government and of all the society, property of man in man. All the other institutions of society carry out, in this, in, carry out into practice that principle that men, all men have property in each other and none are to be free, all belong to society, which is bound to protect, to govern, and to provide for all. The shipwrecked mariner on any civilized <clears throat> coast has any has an invaluable has as invaluable property in us all as the highest official in the land. We are taxed to relieve and sustain him, and the pauper tax in all countries is much larger than that which pays the salaries of officials. If the socialists would institute a rigorous analysis of all societies, they would find their institutions differing in little but name, find them all of natural growth and origin, slightly varied by time, law, and circumstances, and all intended to control individual will and action, and to enforce the right of property of, property of man in his fellow man. The slavery principle is almost the only principle of government. The, the distinctive feature of man's social and dependent nature, and the only cement that binds society together and wards off anarchy. You, conservatives of the North, whom we particular address, particularly address, will at once concur with us that slavery in some form, using the word as abolitionists and other isms employ it, is a necessity for man's nature from which none but a Robinson Crusoe or a hermit escapes. Yet while we believe there is a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them, bow they will, and still much of the detail is left for human volition, judgment, action, and discretion. Slavery is a curse or a blessing, just as it is administered, and for its proper administration, individuals and societies are co-jointly responsible. We will listen with pleasure to you when you advise or suggest to us how we shall improve the lot of condition of our Negro slaves. That condition is now vastly better than that of the white free laborer of Western Europe, and it is continually ameliorating as the Negro advances in, society, in civilization and is enhanced in value. Some legislation there ought to be to protect slaves, as well as to protect wives, children, apprentices, and sailors and soldiers. But much legal interference in these relations is worse than none. Slaves are well treated in Virginia, where there is scarce any law to protect them. Most inhumanly treated in Cuba, where there are great law, many laws intended to secure them, for them good treatment. In the general, there in all nat natural relations, of which domestic slavery is one, providence, which ordains the relation, 
throws around it adequate checks to prevent it, its abuse. Ambition impels the strong to acquire power, and benevolently, benevolent affections incline men to exercise power, to cherish, protect, provide for, and govern, not to oppress the weak whom they have vanquished. There is a strength in weakness and dependence in the successful appeals which they make to our pity, our sympathy, and compassion that present in the general sufficient checks to tyrannical exercise of power by superiors. But there are sporadic cases in society, cowardly and cruel. Masters, husbands, officers, and employers who in require the intervention and penalties of the law to restrain or punish them. Man may and should regulate slavery by law. He cannot abolish it, and all attempts to do so but substitute slavery to capital. For slavery to human masters and greatly aggravates the evils they profess to heal. So I'm going to reread that because I think that was a very important uh, passage. He cannot abolish it, and all attempts to do so, but substitutes slavery to capital for slavery to human masters, and greatly aggravates the evils they profess to heal. To meet the issues as now tendered by the black Republicans, conservatives are compelled to maintain that slavery in the abstract is right, but are not bound to uphold or approve any particular form of slavery. Each state has the right and best understands how to manage its own social and domestic affairs. They are eminently matters for state level legislation, and as our foreign relations are very properly and wisely left to the administration of the federal government. Negro slavery is not profitable or useful at the North, and the area and forms of white slavery should not be increased. Whilst there is room in the unsettled parts portions of the earth for free laborers to become proprietors, it is better to be a proprietor than a slave. There can never possibly be a cordial union of the conservatives of the North and South in defense of African slavery, for that commits Northern men to defend all of its actual and imputed abuses, to defend the cruelties of the African slave trader and the West Indi India driver, and the imputed cruelties of the le fictitious, fictitious Legrees of the South. Reference to Simon Legree from uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Evil Slave Master. I know you didn't know that. Uh, you can thank me in the comments. Uh, where, where, where are we? Nor would we have to add, nor would we have them defend our peculiar social institutions. Hands off is what we ask and demand. But as a general principle, all conservatives are equally and jointly interested throughout the world in maintaining that slavery is right, natural, and necessary. This is the only common ground on which we can meet, the only way to save the union, to save religious marriage property and government, nay, society itself. Tis true marriage, property, tis true the success of socialism would, uh, uh, but tis true the success of socialism would but usher in a short spasmodic interim of anarchy, soon to be succeeded by military desp despotism and the reconstruction of old institutions in some form. But society would suffer more pangs than wars or women have ere it reached the calm of despotism. But what earthly good or end or purpose could be advanced by a union of the North and South in the defense of mere African slavery if we left all the rest of the line of defense exposed and at the mercy of the invaders? Permit them to pull down the churches, burn the Bible, divide our lands, annul marriages, inaugurate free love, no government, anarchy, and all on all of which measures they are now equally and actively and as actively bent as on the abolition of Negro slavery. Permit them to do all this and save only the Negroes from the wreck of a ruined world. If saved, they would be of no use, 
but they could not long be saved. The storm that had carried off all the other institutions would soon sweep away Negro slavery. North and Southern, South conservatives are equally interested in adopting a broader platform, one coextensive with that of the isms who assail us. The slavery principle, the first and leading principle of all society and all governments is what they assail and what we must defend. But the recognition and adoption of this principle will avail us not so long as we continue idle, indifferent, and passive. We must imitate their zeal and activity. Our cause is a better one, our numbers and means greater. We must meet agitation by counter-agitation, propagandism by counter-propagandism. We must establish and support presses, deliver lectures and write books and essays to sustain the cause of government against anarchy, of religion against infidelity, of private property against agrarianism, and of female virtue and Christian marriage against free love. We must invoke the strong, all-pervading arm of Christian common law, which our ancestry brought from Europe, England. Aeneas, in, his hur in the hurry of his flight from the sacked, burning Troy, forgot not his lars and penates, his household gods, nor did our ancestors, flying from oppression, leave their laws and religion behind. It is time to invoke the raid, for our people are forgetting the arm that conducted them from a worse from a worse than Egyptian bond, age bondage to a fairer and ampler land than Palestine. They deal with familiar spirits, they worship Mammon and Belial, and de and deny the God who saved them. Ishurin waxed fat and kicked. The common law in the hands of such men as Mayor Wood would reach and punish every offense for contempt or disturbance of Christianity, as usually practiced and understood by Anglo-Saxon communities. Violations of decency and of Christian morality and all acts and or words written or spoken of that tend to directly to disturb the peace, security, and good order of society are breaches of the common law, punishable by it. So, this has been a portion, reading a portion of uh, George Fitzhugh's book. It's it's there's two parts to the essay. And it's quite a good essay, and uh, I quite enjoyed reading it. And I think I'm going to stop there. I find it very interesting that uh, I believe slavery is going to come back in the near future. And unfortunately, the white race has been prepped for slavery. And uh, there's a lot to be said about white slavery in the near future. I believe uh, the whole setup, the whole structure that's been created for the idea of white slavery is very interesting because... For the most part, you're going to see a whole nation of Africans who are born to slavery because most people don't have the perspective like Mencius Moldbug is a guy who belongs stuffed inside of a locker room and uh, Curtis Yarvin. You know, it's just not working. You know, it's just not working. And uh, it never did work. So if you have the perspective of a certain type of individual, uh, You'd uh, say if somebody like uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, you can't think like him. You can't have a Nathan Bedford Forrest mindset. You know, that's not something you can peddle because it's not attainable. You know, you can have a bulldog mindset or you can have a gorilla mindset. Or we could put them both in a pit and have them fight to the death to see which mindset was better while all the time knowing that both mindsets were garbage. But uh, it's just intellectual or idle curiosity, not even intellectual curiosity. You want to see which one was better. So you throw them both in a, in a ditch, you know, where, which they couldn't scramble out of and see, you know, say, uh, we might haul the, the, uh, we might toss a rope to the winner of, uh, the elimination contest. One might say, so we'd see a pit bull mindset versus the gorilla mindset. Where I'm going with that is 
you have to have that Nathan Bedford Forrest mindset to understand the future of or the way the powers that be might look at things. For example, you have the whole racial substructure and you look at Mexicans. Mexicans were once known as, you know, lazy greasers. You know, that was the insult. You know, they're always leaning against a wall sleeping. You know, they won one video or one war ever, uh, Cinco de Mayo, whatever. They won one battle in one war ever. And fortunately, it was good enough to turn the tide in favor of the uh, Juarez, I think it was, against the Emperor Maximilian, who may or may not have been Napoleon's grandson. But uh, as an aside, but uh, what's interesting is that you look at the Hispanics today, they suddenly became these uh, diligent drywall hangers when removed from their agrarian roots and from the natural stultifying elements of Masonic Mexico and uh, achieve some level of success on a playing field in which they were allowed or had the ability to play illegally. And I don't mean just being illegal immigrants. I mean, uh, being able to cut corners, just being a individuals who pretty much were in a constant uh, uh, temporary autonomous zone, I think is was it Hackin Bay that came up with that con concept. So wherever they tra traversed throughout the United States was a, indeed a temporary autonomous zone for Hispanics. So at the end of the day, they're really not ready to go into slavery as the Hebrew Israelites would put it. They're not prepared for that. And uh, you see the whites are very much prepared for it in a variety of senses. And moreover, you see the ascendancy of the Africans in the United States at this time. You see, you have two Nigerians as champions in the UFC. And usually combat sports are very indicative of the way the populations go in a certain way, shape, or form. But at the end of the day, you see those Africans are born to be slave masters, be they over American blacks or over whites. Because at this time, you have to realize the vast majority of whites are not the kind of whites that conquered the world. They're not, they have no, any, even, there's no connection between Hernando Cortes or individuals like that or Sir Francis Drake or Jan Sabisky, or Jean Sabisky, or whatever. There's no connection between these guys and, uh, and, and uh, people today, uh, the servile races today in the United States and people place far more, far too much uh, importance on the color of skin. And I don't just say that because of my background as so much as that's just the reality of the situation. It's not saying that I'm getting any farther than they are or any white person, but actually white person. But the point of the matter is, the white race has significantly degenerated into a position where the vast majority of them are ready, willing, and able to serve as active slaves. Now, how that's another issue there is that they've been so far removed from the idea of labor and authority that you might have a problem there, but the Africans will fix that. And people, for the most part, slaves do long for authority. So when you see the Africans come out with the whole dictator mentality, with the whole EDMN mentality, you're going to see, now there's a mindset to have, EDMN mindset. Now that's something you might be able to attain to. Might not be able to make the Nathan Bedford Forrest mindset, but the EDMN mindset, especially for Africans, is attainable. So... Again, the, the whole idea of race and IQ, you know, whites are more than happy to serve a dominant black who realizes their genus. That is their dream of a dominant black leader who accepts the responsibility but recognizes their genius. And that's the, the end goal of every white nerd, you know. And so I think the end goal of a lot of the 
movies that demonstrate racism or view them as a sin or going back to William Faulkner and whatever that book is where they buy the slave and get tainted with slave guilt or what have you. The idea of a slave guilt or, or a, a collective guilt or any kind of guilt or reparations, all that is in an end is the idea of, you know, just prepared for the idea of a dominant African who runs things and to whom you answer to as a white person. And uh, so you can get the power grid running. So everybody has got power and that works for everybody all the time, you know, because everybody's happy. We have power in our third world society that is governed by an African who takes your advice as a white man. This is the peak of civilization as far as a white liberals or a white uh, alternative rightists uh, mindset is concerned. And uh, this is a problem that a lot of people have in failing to understand that. But the Africans are definitely going to be a problem in the future because of their, uh, it will all be individuals of this nature, uh, what you might say, foreigners who will be intentionally placed in positions of power to lord it over the former, the kulaks, basically, as it were. And uh, so in these times, again, I'm, you go back to Fitzhugh's uh, antidote for the problem and uh, see how out of touch that was and how useless it was to suggest in the first place. But nonetheless, it's far from the end. So I think uh, I was going to do a video, a couple of videos, uh, I'm going to do an analysis of QAnon Shaman because nobody has done a good analysis of QAnon Shaman. And there's a lot to be unpacked there that you don't deserve to hear about. And you might not. And uh, moreover, I was going to do a reading from Robert Stark's book, uh, Journey to Vapor Island. So that will probably be our next live reading. And uh, I will also be doing a video on the other channel, which is Black Pill Fitness uh, Productions. Uh, go ahead and check that out, uh, Black Pill Fitness Productions. And I'm going to be doing some videos on that. Some, some of the videos will be talking about the philosophy of strength. Some, some of the videos will be demonstrating actual techniques to build strength and uh, so forth and so on. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to close this broadcast, which has been another one that you don't deserve by the high priest of Keck. Hail victory and long live death.